Good evening and welcome to the Rosenmeyer Center for State and Local Government, our forum this evening presenting Thomas Hansen and U.S. Foreign Policy and the 2018 e midterm elections. On behalf of Steve Wenzel, who is the ex executive director of the Rosenmeyer Center, I extend a welcome to each of you. Uh, the Rosenmeyer Center for State and Local Government has as its mission the education of our area citizens on key issues that will affect all of us. And tonight, in an effort to help us better understand the world and how it impinges on our decision-making process at the national, state, and local level, we are pleased to welcome Thomas Hansen, former Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. State Department, and now among many, many things he does. Please read his full bio in your programs. But just very quickly, he is uh, chair of the uh, Minnesota Council on Foreign Relations, the Minnesota China Business Council, and he is a uh, diplomat in residence at the University of Minnesota. That's just for starters. Um, so we just endured, I guess say endured, a very long and tumultuous 2018 election cycle. And now we are greatly in need of the keen powers of analysis by Thomas Hansen to help us sort through, sift through, figure out what are the challenges, what are some unique opportunities perhaps uh, as we deal with the results of this election. Tom will pr make his presentation in segments and then open up uh, questions for the audience after each of the segments. So be thinking of questions you might want to answer. We have two people with microphones, so please uh, wait and ask your question uh, via the microphone. Uh, and then he will continue on with his presentation and questions and answers after. Uh, he does want to conclude at 8.30. He has to drive back to the cities, unfortunately, yet tonight for an 8 o'clock big presentation tomorrow morning. So. Uh, but we'll still have a good hour and a half of uh, important information from Tom and a chance for you to ask questions. And now please join me in welcoming our presenter, Thomas Hansen. Well, thank you, Laura, very much. As you can see, this evening's presentation is brought to you by Norton Internet Security, uh, which, <laughs> you know how it is. These computers have a mind of their own. So let me get rid of this here. Uh, there we go. So, um, well, thanks, Laura, very much. And uh, pleasure to be back here on this cold, wintry evening um, in the immediate aftermath of a heated uh, midterm election cycle. And um, I'll be talking a bit about some of the implications of that, of that election for, for our foreign policy. Um, it strikes me that we're kind of entering into phase three of the Trump uh, administration in foreign policy, and I'll try to make clear what I mean by that. Um, as, uh, as Laura said, we'll be, uh, I'll be kind of pausing at the end of certain segments, asking if there's any questions or thoughts, and then going on to the next. We can go somewhat over 8.30. I, 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 it's not a hard and fast. We'll, we'll see how we're doing. So um, the, uh, the backdrop to what we're discussing tonight, and I often uh, begin presentations with this because I think it really is sort of the important context uh, for our foreign policy. Uh, that the backdrop is in two maps. This map is the one that we um, uh, that we probably have all imprinted on, uh, really since 1945, when the United States took on a central role in the global economy and global uh, global politics. Uh, map with the, us in the center, of course, uh, with two regions of the world, uh, our European allies on one side, our allies in Asia on the other, um, our Navy, sort of the linchpin for a global trading system that was pretty much in this structure, an alliance system as well. It's estimated that as late as 1980, about 95% of global free trade took place among just 17 nations along these uh, to ocean areas. Uh, much of the world was outside of the global free trading system. China, of course, walled off uh, with the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Soviet Union, having set up walls in Europe. 
and even India, which uh, until the early 1990s was not an open trading system. So this was a world of walls built by the other side. It was a cocoon in a way. Uh, and all of this changed. And those two separate continents, it looks like, on the other side, either side of this map, suddenly returned to their normal situation uh, and thereby creating, oops, I guess I have to just bear with me for a second. Whatever that, there we go. So, OK. Um, and so that map has been replaced today. This is the mental map we should all have in mind now. Uh, that's one continent, in fact, that we saw on the two sides of the other map, the continent of Eurasia. It's becoming increasingly the center of global uh, dem demography, also of uh, the future world economy, um, as it often has been throughout human history. And a lot of what I'll be talking about tonight is the weaving together, the beginnings now of a real uh, interlocking of this continent uh, and how we are reacting to it. Because this really is, as I say, the background for, of, for much of what is happening. The other uh, factor, of course, is our own domestic politics, which, as we all know, is more divided now, more polarized than it has been for some time, certainly more so than at any time during the Cold War, when, as they used to say, politics stopped at the water's edge. There was a, a general consensus on foreign policy in the context of the Cold War. Um, when the Cold War ended in 1989, 1991, it's as if the world became demagnetized. Uh, the structure, the bipolar structure that had held things in place was gone. And um, whether it was Yugoslavia breaking up or other, other, the Japanese party system coming into disarray, our own domestic politics were affected by this. And it's part of what has led to this growing polarization. So now we have great uh, oscillations between administrations. And this is causing the rest of the world to look at us uh, and wonder what path the United States is on. We've become a factor for uncertainty, even as we still are at the center of these uh, post-World War, post War II institutions. So going from President Obama to President Trump, uh, we've had uh, an undoing of really many of the policies uh, from the Obama years. Um, the basic fact of the matter is that those policies were not grounded in congressional approval, in treaty approval. Uh, uh, President Obama never had a majority for many of the international agreements he signed, not for the Paris Climate Agreement, not for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not for the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, he could not have gotten a two-thirds vote. So he did them all by executive order. And executive orders can be undone by another executive order, which is what we're seeing now uh, with uh, President Trump. And this is, as I say, leading to some uncertainty uh, in the world and people wondering whether we're going to stabilize, whether this, these swings and this polarization is temporary or whether it's going to characterize us going forward. Now, President Trump, uh, even though his Twitters and tweets have, uh, have caused some confusion and a lot of media attention, he's actually been very consistent in his view of the world. Um, he took out this ad in uh, both Washington Post and New York Times 32 years ago, basically saying exactly what he's saying now, which is the rest of the world is taking advantage of us, especially on trade. Uh, they don't really respect us, and this has got to stop. We have to stand up, backbone. Well, and of course, this is what is leading to uh, tariffs and all kinds of, uh, uh, of policies now uh, toward the outside world. Uh, Wilbur Ross, the uh, Secretary of Commerce, summed up this administration early on by saying, if you want to understand Trump's foreign policy, all you need is one word, and that word is bilateral. Bilateral, bilateral. Whenever we uh, get involved in multinational negotiations, um, we lose, and, uh, uh, and we're going to try to do everything bilaterally. And of course, we have pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the um, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, as I said, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, just last April, there were rumors that maybe the U.S. would reconsider going back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and Trump said, quote, no, 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 too many contingencies and no way to get out of it if it doesn't work. Bilateral deals are much more efficient, profitable, 
and better for our workers. So uh, this really is the, the reflex. Now, in pulling out of the Paris deal, for example, Paris Climate Agreement, um, it's not quite as bad as it looks. It's very symbolic. Under that agreement, you cannot really pull out for four years. So in fact, there's a US representative at all of the Paris climate uh, talks, um, not taking initiatives, but there and taking it all in. And at the local level and state level, the US is doing a lot to comply with the Paris Agreement. So in fact, there's still a lot underway uh, on climate um, in spite of this symbolic move by President Trump. Now, phase one of the Trump foreign policy was really the first year he was settling in. He was focused primarily on domestic issues, uh, trying to change Obamacare, uh, what eventually became the $1.5 trillion tax cuts, massive tax cuts. Um, and his key advisors tended to be fairly mainstream, uh, fairly cautious, people like Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, and Rex Tillerson at the State Department. And uh, I was in a meeting with Tillerson um, uh, during his tenure in which he made it clear that when he and Mattis and uh, McMaster, who then was the National Security Advisor, agreed, they could often weigh in on President Trump and affect his uh, judgment. Um, Tillerson, Mattis have been in favor of staying in the Iran nuclear deal, for example. They, they have been moderating voices. And this is, as I say, phase one. Well, this is all changing now. Uh, Mike Pompeo has replaced uh, Tillerson. He's um, much more aggressive on issues like Iran. There are rumors now that Mattis may leave early next year, increasing rumors that he'll be gone. That's another moderating voice. And John Bolton has come in as the National Security Advisor, who is a very aggressive uh, foreign policy uh, expert. He's got a lot of experience and is very focused on Iran and on trying to strangle the Iranian economy. Um, so under this new team, uh, phase two has been underway really for most of this year. And we're seeing it in the more aggressive policies toward Iran, toward, in the tariffs that are being enacted and in a shift against China, which I'll describe uh, in a minute. And of course, the whole China issue uh, is all about jobs, but not only. I think that the, the, the main fear in Washington is that China is beginning to move ahead of us in tech. That, and and, and uh, Deng, uh, Xi Jinping has announced publicly that China intends to be the number one technological power in the world by 2025, uh, taking the lead in artificial intelligence other areas which have huge military implications. So as I say, phase two is underway. It's a much more active and aggressive foreign policy. So what does this all mean? Well, uh, Robert Kagan here, he's one of the most prominent foreign policy intellectuals in the US. He's, I guess, what you call a neoconservative. He's in favor of a very active US role in promoting our values, promoting democracy, getting involved militarily wherever uh, we can have a positive influence in his view. He was a key advisor to three presidential candidates in a row, all of them losing candidates, uh, John McCain, then Mitt Romney, and then Hillary Clinton, who was very close to Bob Kagan. So Kagan has a new book out, and it's called The Jungle Grows Back. Now You can imagine where this goes. Uh, the idea is that if the United States does not take this active role, uh, if it starts to draw back, become more bilateral, uh, more inward looking, then the world left to its own devices will become a jungle. Now, if I were living outside of the United States, I would be offended by this analysis. The idea that only with American influence and power can the world be anything but a jungle. Um, in any event, that's his analysis. And he had an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago titled, America First Has Won, which of course is some, not something he advocates. And he. He posed the basic question. I was at conferences in the UK uh, in September and had a lot of conversations with European academics, and they were asking pretty much the same question that, that Bob Kagan raised, and that is, and Kagan phrases it as follows, are we experiencing now with President Trump uh, an aberration or a culmination? Is it a temporary uh, set of policies that will be undone just the way Trump was able to undo Obama's policies? Or does he represent deeper forces 
at work in the U.S., which will continue into the future. Um, Kagan is convinced it's a culmination, that this goes much beyond Trump. Um, and that's what I heard in these conferences, people saying basically if it's, a, if it's a short period, even like one term, we can sit it out, wait it out. But if it's going to be long, if it's going to be the whole eight years and beyond, then we have to start changing our policies now, uh, adjusting to, to this new reality. Um, the jury is out, obviously, and it's in this context that the outside world has been looking at our midterm elections to get a sense of whether this is an aberration or a culmination of deeper trends. Um, you know, the results from the election are, are quite mixed. Um, uh, on the one hand, taking the House is very significant. Taking the House of Representatives, it will allow the Democrats now to, uh, using their committee chairmanships, to call hearings, to subpoena, to, to shine a light on a lot of issues, mostly domestic, whether it's the president's finances or aspects of Russian relations, that sort of thing. They're in a better position to do that. Um, but the real prominent role in foreign affairs in Congress is with the Senate. Under our Constitution, it's the Senate that has the right to approve ambassadors, approve treaties by a two-thirds vote. Uh, they have the upper hand in appropriations as well. Um, and in the Senate, the Republicans actually gained seats. So uh, in terms of the foreign policy changes, it's not clear that, uh, that this will have a major impact <clears throat> apart from uh, as I say, allowing the Democrats to shine a light on things like Yemen, the tragedy we're, we're aiding and abetting in Yemen, or uh, relations with Saudi Arabia, or things like that. Um, you know, appropriations in the Congress, both sides, House and Senate, have their own appropriations committees. They come up with uh, their positions on what the government has asked for in terms of defense spending, other things. And then they go into what's called reconciliation, where they meet, both houses meet, and try to work it out between them. So there again, the congressional, the, the, the House of Representatives voice for the Democrats will be uh, more influential there. I, I talked with a few friends in Europe uh, in the last couple of days, get their reaction, and they, they pointed out a very uh, inconvenient truth from their point of view. Uh, both President Clinton and President Obama did far worse in their midterm, equivalent midterm elections than Trump has done here, and they both got reelected. So the idea is that, as far as they're concerned, this election does not prove that it's, a, that it's an aberration. The jury is still very much out. So I think this confusion uh, will continue in the next period. But we are entering a third phase now, where, uh, where this shift in the Congress may have some impact. Now, the, the, you know, I'm going to have to focus on a few specific areas here. Uh, uh, I'll try to highlight the basic shifts that have gone on in our foreign policy. Uh, before I do, though, any thoughts or questions at this juncture before I get into primarily relations with China? Yes. Um, it goes along with the nationalism. And I was wondering if you'd comment about how that also seems to be true throughout the world. You have in, yeah. in Europe and in now South um, America where there seems to be this nationalism and, you know, your country is number one and it's going throughout the world. Very much, yeah. The, 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 the shift toward populism, toward a kind of greater national identification, uh, is, goes way beyond our borders. I, I think what happened here and with Brexit probably uh, kind of increased a little bit the momentum of this, of this kind of movements around the world. But, um, but it, it is pretty common and, it, of course, President Trump speaking to the UN, to the ultimate multilateral organization, the UN General Assembly, his speech was all about bilateralism. He encouraged everyone to have a bilateral outlook, to, to, to defend their own interests, uh, just the way we do. And he said, you know, we want, we want fair trade, uh, we want you know, fairness toward our country, but it should be, all be bilateral. And of course, he also said, and we want you know, America first, you should put your countries first too. Um, I don't know why this is happening so quickly. Um, you know, there's an, an analyst, uh, uh, Kishore Mabubani, who is Indian but works at the Lee Kuan Yew School, very influential. Uh, he had an article recently on why 
why this populism. And he said the, the reasons differ according to the, re, to, 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 the, to the region. He says in Europe, it's because of immigration. Uh, these are nation states that aren't used to the massive kind of immigration we've always had. Uh, they, they have protected their working class better in many ways than we have. And therefore, the real force is immigration. He said, whereas in the US, it's plutocracy that's causing this. It's inequality. It is this, uh, a sense of a lot of people that their prospects are not as, as, as good as they used to be. Um, immigration gets the blame. But in fact, the real underlying factor, he argues, is, is economic in the US. Um, I know in Brazil, where Bolsonaro just won, uh, has a lot to do with crime, a lot to do with the general feeling of insecurity in the population, leading to a vote for a stronger leader. Um, more generally, in a world of, of globalization, you know, I'll be describing this a bit more, uh, the supply chains that are at work, uh, you know, there's been a kind of a, a concentration of, of wealth in many countries. And really, uh, citizens can only vote for their national leaders. Uh, there's no global government. You can't vote for the head of a multinational corporation. And so in this environment, I think that national leaders are standing up now saying, we're the ones who can protect you uh, against these larger forces. Um, and so I think it's a mix of all those. And then I think in, time, in very complex times, and these are complex times, people look to a certain core identity. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a point of, of, of orientation. And so I think everywhere you look, people are looking kind of to that, uh, to that kind of thing. Tom Friedman, who is probably the great globalizer, you know, Lexus and the olive tree, the world is flat in his last book, urged everyone to find that kind of a point. For, his, for him, it was St. Louis Park in the 1950s and the Lincoln Dell. You know, he has this whole thing about the Lincoln Dell. In, in the, but I mean, so even Tom, who's a great globalist, is saying you got to find your local point. Now, he says you got to do that and be global. You've got to do both. Um, but, uh, but he's responding to, these new, to, to this new out, outlook that, as you say, is very widespread. Any other thought at this point? Um, well, China, which is uh, a big part of the story now. Um, it's estimated that since... 2008, and by the way, this December, it's going to be the 40th anniversary of China's opening. I don't know how China will celebrate it, but it was December 1978 when Deng Xiaoping said to the Chinese people, it's glorious to be rich, and it's fine if people get rich before others, and we should rise quietly, hide our strength, uh, and emerge peacefully. Uh, 40 years. Well, since 2008, and the economic crisis, 40% uh, of all global growth has been in China, 40%. Um, their manufacturing sector is half again as large as ours at this point. They account for a quarter of all global manufacturing. And as I say, they're moving up the value chain on, on high tech. So this is, this is a, formidable, uh, a formidable situation. It's much more complicated than the old Cold War with Russia. Russia was never an economic competitor of America. It was, it was a, a, an arms race, primarily. Now, China's got a lot of problems. And um, in spite of the fact that here they're about to come up to be uh, almost equal to us in GDP uh, by the mid, around 2030, in purchasing power parity terms, which is another way of measuring GDP, they passed us in 2012. So I mean, it depends on how you measure it. Uh, this is obviously not per capita. This is in terms of aggregate. But in spite of this performance, they've got a lot of problems. And uh, OK, I guess I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so uh, uh, President Trump, I, I've said this before. If anybody uh, here has heard previous presentations, hold your ears now, because I'm going to make a very lame joke. Um, the only person still in that room is Andrew Jackson. Um, as you can, this is the whole first Trump team. You know, it, gives, it, it doesn't seem that long ago, and it just it kind of gives you a sense of how chock-a-block everything has been since he got elected. We're in phase two, entering phase three. And so Kelly and Sean Spicer and good old Steve Ballin, uh, Bannon and uh, Rance Priebus are long gone. But at this early stage, the first thing that Trump did was to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He signaled right away he was not going to be involved bilaterally or multilaterally. So he pulled out of the signature trade agreement of President Obama. 
uh, part of his pivot, an agreement that had excluded China. Well, China quite quickly stepped in. Within a matter of weeks, uh, Xi Jinping decided to appear at the Davos annual meeting in, in January of the global elite. Um, he gave a speech in which he said, hey, China is open for business. We support free trade. We support the Paris Climate Agreement. We we're against tariffs. Protectionism is like locking yourself in a dark room with no air and making the clear contrast to President Trump. I mention this because a year later, Trump went to the World Economic Forum. And I'll talk about that um, just in a little bit. So catching up with myself now, yes, China has uh, a lot of problems. They're not 10 feet tall. And Xi Jinping is very clear to the Chinese people that they have three uh, existential threats facing them that they have got to address. Number one, poverty and inequality. There's some ex extremely rich people in China now, but there's a lot of poverty. And um, uh, you know the, the pollution is stunting the growth of children all around the country, the bad water, uh, stunting their mental growth. Uh, they've got a lot that they have to deal with here. Um, there is a debt bomb in China. They have invested heavily to keep people working, especially since 2008. There's been a lot of loans by, you know, to local officials to build bridges and housing and roads, which really don't have any purpose. These are being built with really no demand for them. In many cases, uh, there are estimated to be 65 million empty housing units in China today. 65 million. That is the same, roughly the same number of displaced persons in the world. So you, you see a lot of these projects as you travel around China where you build it and they will come and they, they're not there yet. Um, that's the second challenge. And the third, of course, is pollution. Uh, th this recent satellite photo shows what is, you can see what's pollution and what are, what are clouds. Uh, it's, it's staring them in the face. They've got to get a handle on this. Uh, and so when we're here in Minnesota, it doesn't stare us in the face up here. You know, you, if you're not reading the newspapers, you can go around and we still have a lot of water and fresh air. Uh, but uh, in, in a place like China, they do see it. So these are all problems that they've got to address. But they are, on the basis of the last 40 years and the, the economic strength they've gathered, the, the huge surplus they have, trade surplus, not, not domestic, they are beginning to launch major initiatives, including probably what is the largest economic initiative in the world today. Uh, about three years ago, uh, uh, Xi Jinping announced uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, the, uh, the New Silk Road, it's called. This is a massive infrastructure project. Uh, trillions of dollars invite, uh, involving 70 countries which have signed on board, including most of our allies, to create, and I come back to that second map, infrastructure all across this Eurasian space to link it up. Um, High-speed rail, ports, uh, uh, high-speed internet, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of infrastructure on a, on a, on a joint basis. Uh, this will all link up with what the Chinese have been doing in Africa. The Chinese have announced that Africa is a part of the Silk Road. So a lot of what they've been doing there will kind of hook up with this. And there's a lot of buy-in from our European allies. In addition to which, the Indians and Chinese or J Japanese who are not participating have announced their own Silk Road project to do the same thing. So as, as they begin to compete, this will only speed up the linking up of this part of the world. Historically, it's quite interesting to, to put this into a longer, longer perspective. Um, the Silk Road has always been the center of the global economy, you know, before the new, new world was, was more fully developed. And the Han Dynasty in China was linked to ancient Rome by this trade route. It continued very actively into the Muslim era. Around 900, the biggest cities in the world were along the, the, this trade route. Uh, I think China had the largest, but next came Baghdad and a city called Merv which no longer exists, was probably the third largest city in the world. This all changed in the 1200s, 1300s with the Mongol invasions. City of Merv ceased to exist. A city of over one million people was gone. Uh, it never recovered. This region never recovered. Uh, and then you add to that the Great Plague, which started in China in the 1300s, came all the way across Eurasia, just devastating, ended up the farthest reach was into Norway. Uh, a, a ship arrived in Bergen Har Harbor in 1348. And three months later, 60% of the Norwegian population was dead. 60%. They didn't recover until the 1700s. So 
this is pretty much closed. And it led to what historians now are calling the maritime shift. So with those routes closed uh, and with naval technology developing, uh, the European powers began to look for sea routes and uh, pretty soon they'd come to the New World and they'd come all the way to India and the structure of the modern economy slowly took shape. To this day, the global economy is sea-based. Most of the trade between Asia, Europe, and the U.S. goes by sea. Containerization, large container ships have allowed massive amounts of goods to be moved around. You know, in this whole period of hundreds of years, um, I mean, it, the British never got to the Raj, never got to India overland, never. It was always by sea. The Indonesians developed, uh, the Indonesia was developed by the Dutch all by sea. What if this fundamental structure, which we inherited after World War II, uh, we took over the British role assuring this kind of a trade structure, what if that's going to be fundamentally changed by what the Chinese are doing? Um, this is something that's going to take a while, but it's underway. Here are the 70 heads of state meeting in Shanghai last year. Um, we are, we are opposing this, and uh, as of the earlier this year, we're actively opposing it. These are the kind of trains that will be crossing Eurasia. They're magnetic levitation. They leave the track and uh, are held in place by magnetism, and they reach 510 kilometers an hour. And these are I mean, transport trains. Um, the Russians are all on board for this. You know, Russia is 11 time zones going across Eurasia, and they see their future uh, in this, and they're especially uh, excited about this prospect. As global warming increases, there's going to be a northern sea route across Eurasia. It's already in use part of the year. You, and so the shortest route for European goods to Asia potentially will be across this northern, these northern seas. It'll, it'll cut the time enormously. As I say, this is, this is very tectonic. It's taking shape, but uh, there's a lot of buy-in. Washington was shocked earlier this year um, when Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, young, dynamic, pro-NATO, pro-EU, he saved France from populism. Uh, his government announced the transatlantic era is over. This is a country that borders the Atlantic. And uh, the statement went on to say, uh, with Brexit, Britain has become uncertain. The United States is very uncertain now. They're starting to institute tariffs. So that this trading structure is coming to an end. And the goal of French policy is to create a backbone, that's the word they used, across Eurasia from Europe to Beijing via Moscow. The French are the number one investors in Russia today. Uh, now, were they serious? Were they just trying to get our attention? Washington is still trying to figure it out. But the French are very actively involved in the new Silk Road. Uh, as are the Germans uh, and, and the British as well, uh, most of our allies, in, in spite of our attempts to dissuade them. So um, now I'm going to get into Russia here just for a bit. So any questions? I just threw a lot at you about China, but any questions uh, on, on, that area, on that area of what's happening? Yes. Yeah. Right. I can always come we're, up We're working question. this out. We have a deal going in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is what does the U.S. say in opposition to it? What would be a reason? Why would we try to convince our allies not to go along with the yeah. new path, Silk Path? Well, um, we initially we tried very hard to convince, and this was under Obama, convince our allies not to get on board, basically saying the liberal international order is still strong. We have all the institutions we need in the World Bank and INF. We don't want China setting the standards. They will not respect uh, the kind of free trade that we want, and therefore, let's not let them take this central role. Um, now, David Cameron, who was then the Prime Minister of Britain, surprised everyone by standing up and saying, Britain wants to be a founding member of this new project and wants to be a founding member of something called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, which the Chinese are creating to finance this. And they're welcoming everyone to participate, including us. They're saying, let's all pool our resources in this project. So Britain said, we want to be a founding member. 
Um, and of course, Washington was not happy about that because once the British did it, many other countries joined. So Cameron was asked, why did you do that? Why did you do that to the Americans? And he said, well, look, you know, China, India, Brazil, other countries like that have taken a greater role in the global economy. The 1945 institutions do not reflect that. Um, IMF, World Bank. So he said, three years ago, we voted in the IMF and World Bank to give China, to give India greater voice, more positions, greater role. We all agreed. He said, that's been blocked in the US Congress for the past three years. We're not going to wait any longer for US dysfunction. That was his quote. Um, the idea being that, um, if, that, kind of saying that China has a right at this point to start setting up its own institutions because they're, they're, they're not being given the right uh, amount of influence in their own. The other argument we're using now against the Silk Road is two of them. Number one, is this really quality infrastructure? We're, we're saying to all these countries, now, now, you, know, do you really think the Chinese are going to build quality infrastructure? Wouldn't you rather wait, wait for us? How long that wait would be is hard to say, but anyway, uh, to wait for us to get higher quality infrastructure. The second one is, uh, you're going to get yourself into debt servitude. The Chinese are going to come. They're going to offer you loans to, to finance this. They're going to bring their own workers. They're going to build your roads and your ports. But when, they, when they're finished, you're going to have a huge debt. You're not going to be able to pay it. Then they will exercise leverage on you. And they, we're citing the example of Sri Lanka, where the, the, the Chinese built a big port for Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka couldn't pay it off right away, so they arranged a temporary deal where China takes over the port. Uh, they have access now, they have privileged access to the main port of Sri Lanka. Now, they're not using it militarily, but still, I mean, so we're using those arguments to, to dissuade people. Yes? Uh, you know, it's a little bit like um, the recent uh, election uh, campaigns. Uh, all we can do is give them give them negatives about why not to join, but we are, we ha we are not offering an alternative vision about what 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 is it that we have to offer other than just yeah. doing negative campaigning in a way. Well, that's that's the problem, and that's I think a lot of people see that. You know, we we've we've had declaratory policies i mean obama had the year of africa where he kind of it was a symbolic thing nothing happened as a result of the year of africa there was no new investment um uh hillary clinton as secretary of state gave a speech announcing a silk road idea but well, but beyond that nothing happened there was no you know in fact some people even think that she uh, xi jinping got the idea from hillary's speech which which was in like 2011 you know, but nothing, nothing happened. Now, as I'll describe in a minute, we're trying to really trying to derail this thing. So Trump announced just a couple weeks ago, oh, we're going to have our own Silk Road um, financial package. I think he announced $65 million, which is not very much. And the problem is people look at our finances with the tax cuts, with increased military spending. We're talking about middle class tax cuts. We're talking about infrastructure. Do we have money? to get involved in a major project like this? Probably not. So as I say, I, there's a sense out in the world that we're not going to wait around for America on this, on this. So yes, yeah. So if they're building a Silk Road from China, Africa, Europe, they're going to run into Afghanistan, yep. Iran, Iraq, Middle East. It's a mess. Is yeah. that going to change that situation? Are they going to, these people, put down their, their arms in order to make money? Or is what's going to win out there? It's a really good question. You know, the, the one thing, Pakistan is a major part of the Silk Road. China and Pakistan are very close. They have a nuclear relationship. It drives India nuts. Um, but pipelines, the Gwadar port, they're, they're building in, in, in Pakistan. And while we have been militarily involved in Afghanistan, the Chinese have come in and bought up all the mineral rights in Afghanistan. And so they are in the catbird seat. In fact, we're looking to them to help a little bit with the Taliban now, since they're also close to Pakistan. So I think their hope is that they, they can stabilize this region. Also, Central Asia is very important to them. Um, 
you know, whether that's at all feasible is another question. They may be getting in over their heads. They're not sending military. China is not sending out troops and not establishing bases in this process. They are, they are, um, they have one base and it's in Djibouti off of Somalia. Everybody has a base in Djibouti. Everybody has a little base there. And, and they say it's for uh, sort of um, working with UN forces in the region. So, no, it's a, it's, it's a very ambitious thing and they could well run into it, but the problems in there, but, but, the, but their main thrust is, is Central Asia up through Russia, then Central Europe. Central Europe is all excited about this. The city of Prague is gonna be at the intersection of two major axes of the new Silk Road. They're all, I, mean, I go to Prague School of Economics several times a year. They're all excited and the Chinese are all over Prague. They're building a major port in Piraeus, Greece. The Greeks are all excited. We don't need the EU as much as we used to. You know, so even if the Middle East is in disarray, this the, the basic outlines are are there, and we've actually been somewhat happy. If, if I guess we're saying, saying the Chinese, if you can help to stabilize Pakistan economically, go for it. Right? Okay. You know, I mean, we're we're not opposing what they're doing there necessarily. We're, we're not participating either. So yeah. Any other? Okay, yeah, because um, the other part of this, of course, is Russia. And um, President Trump has been rightly criticized for his uh, kind of public embrace of, of, of President Putin, this kind of romance that's been going on between the two of them. One of the real I, sort of iron, ironies and dichotomies of the, of the Trump administration is that, in fact, he has been much harder on Russia, much harder on Russia, than any of his predecessors. Um, you know, the whole Ukraine situation is still festering. Um, we haven't changed our policy uh, on, on Ukraine. We still oppose uh, what the Russians have done there. We still have heavy sanctions. The sanctions have been strengthened under President Trump. Um, this is how it looks from Moscow that you can see. As they look south, uh, the Baltic states, of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have come into NATO. Ukraine wants to come in. Um, and look at how close this is to Moscow and St. Petersburg. You know, they, 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 so they basically are saying no more NATO expansion, and certainly not to Ukraine. And they'll fight to stop it. It's pretty clear. I mean, as President Obama said once, they want it more than we do. And they're willing to escalate beyond what we uh, are willing to do. Um, so previous administrations, uh, especially the Obama administration, did not want to give uh, military aid to the Ukrainian opposition because that would just further inflame the conflict. Well, the Trump administration has sent military aid to Ukraine. Uh, uh, they've sent uh, uh, anti-tank, anti anti-tank, anti uh, anti-aircraft weapons. Um, the Russians are not happy about this at all. Um, you know, we have closed a number of consulates. The, Russians have closed San Francisco and Seattle. Our consulate in St. Petersburg is closed. If you're, most American tourists go to St. Petersburg, they have no consular representation there now. It's all closed. Each side has kicked out hundreds, hundreds of diplomats. Uh, they say this is unprecedented, and uh, it's happening under Trump. It's, a, it's, as I say, one of the real dichotomies. And this is the, this is the weak point of NATO now as it's expanded in the East. It used to be something called the Fulda Gap coming uh, into, into Germany. That's where NATO trained. Now it's the, this, the uh, Sewalski Gap, um, a little piece of land between Belarus, where the Russians have troops, and Kaliningrad, where they have a lot of troops and even nuclear weapons. They could cut that off in a heartbeat. So uh, NATO has been ramping up, and the Trump administration has taken it beyond what Obama did um, with rotating uh, uh, troop presence in the area off of off of um, the Baltic states too. And uh, what's new is that, um, you know, listening to Trump, bilateral, 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 right? The Polish government finally has said, aha, let's make him an offer he can't refuse. So they've approached the US government saying, we will finance $2 billion to help you establish a permanent military base in Poland. And not only that, we'll call it Fort Trump. Kind of hard to resist, right? Well, I mean, this is unprecedented. Ordinarily, all this would go through NATO. The Poles didn't even consult NATO. 
right? Multilateral, bad. They're doing a one-on-one -on -one with Trump trying to get uh, a military base. Um, we're still chewing on it. I don't know where this is going to go, but it's, very, it's a sign of the times, the way this has, uh, has gone. Um, now, the, uh, this phase two of President Trump really started taking shape right at the beginning of the year in January when Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, gave a major press conference announcing our new national security strategy for the United States. Major document, a major change in strategy. And the basic point was this. He said, you know, it's, it's been 16 years then uh, since the 9-11 attacks. And terrorism is no longer the number one priority, no longer the number one threat. Wait a minute, I thought that was the, the threat. No, he said, nope, not anymore. The top threat, the top priority now is to maintain a military advantage over China and Russia. And the document defines China and Russia as revisionist powers acting against US interests, trying to undo the international liberal order that we created in 1945, and uh, that this activity must be re more actively resisted. It singles out the new Silk Road as a major strategic threat. It rather starkly says that it was a huge mistake to bring China into the global economy in the first place. Huge mistake. We never should have let them into the WTO. Uh, the document says that the, the mentality uh, after China opened and as our corporations got involved and Walmart began to import masses of Chinese goods, uh, our thought was that, oh, China will change. Our institutions, our traditions are superior, the world is flat, and therefore, by engaging them in the world economy, they'll become responsible stakeholders. That was the, the idea. So just let this go and they'll become like us. Well, this document says that was a, a, a false appraisal. It was totally wrong. And we now must act to, it almost says, push China back out of the global economy. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. It also says, uh, and this is a quote from Mattis, our competitive edge militarily has eroded in every domain of warfare uh, due to our involvements uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I wish we'd known that before we went in. Uh, air, land, sea, space, cyberspace, in all these areas, our advantage is eroding and is continuing to erode. Uh, the wars of the past 16 years have done this, but also the emergence of China and reemergence of Russia. And so a big part of this is going to be massive increases in defense spending over the next few years. Massive, trillions of dollars more. Um, here you can see the, the current state uh, under, a, under President Trump. We're actually, uh, for this year, up over 700 now, $715 uh, billion, and it's going to go up from there. Now, this is on top of the $1.5 trillion tax uh, cut. Um, it's on top of the other kind of projects that we're envis envisaging, and now this too. I'm not sure there's enough there are enough domestic programs to offset this. I'm not sure there are enough to cut. Um, there's still Social Security. Um, anyway, this, at some point, there are more and more articles now starting to come out about our debt situation. The fact that our payment of interest on the debt is going to exceed all of our spending on education, even start to rival our defense spending. Um, uh, but, um, and, and by the way, Democrats are on record saying that for this infrastructure, uh, and Trump has said he'll work with, you know, maybe we're finally, now that there's a new governor in Wisconsin, we may actually get a, high sp a train uh, between Winnipeg and Chicago. It could happen. Uh, it's feasible. But uh, the Democrats are saying, and we can do this through deficit spending. No problem. So you got both parties willing to go way into debt for our uh, current policies. But... The main reaction against China is in the economic sphere. So these are the four horsemen of the tariff apocalypse. Um, you've got Steve Mnuchin to the left there in the glasses. You've got Wilbur Ross. 
you've got Robert Lighthizer, who's the real brains behind this. He's been on the periphery for decades, warning about China, warning about the effects on our economy of trade with China. Finally, he's in. And he and the guy to his left, uh, Peter Navarro, who's the author of a book called Death by China, you can imagine what that's about, um, are, are really thinking we've got a short period, we've got a little time window here to really correct this. And so this, this I think, explains the, the rapid pace now of tariffs and other, other steps. So it's been going, as I say, step by step. Uh, phase two of Trump, already January 22nd, imposing high tariffs on washing machines um, and solar energy panels. We then followed up with tariffs on steel, which, influ which impact all of our allies, not just the Chinese. And then we began to zero in on the Chinese. First with a $50 billion, $50 billion worth of goods, tariffs, the Chinese responded with less, but still they responded. Trump said, okay, another 100, 150 billion. Chinese responded, and now it's $250 billion. There is a scramble going on right now out in the global economy. Um, the tariffs on these $250 billion worth of goods are at 10% temporarily on, on January 1st, they go to 25%. And so all US importers are trying to find container ships, space on container ships to get their goods to a US port by January 1. It is an absolute madhouse out there uh, as people try to avoid these higher tariffs in time. Now, President Trump has said, up oh, tariff wars are easy to fight and easy to win. What does he mean by that? Well, China exports 500, roughly $500 billion worth of goods to us, 500. We export about $140 billion to them. There's a $360 billion uh, trade deficit for the U.S. Well, China, we can, we can threaten $500 billion worth of their, of their exports. They can only threaten $140 billion of ours, so we win. Of course, it's not quite that simple because China has other ways they can react other things that they can do if it goes that far. Trump has announced now that he's preparing uh, the, 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 the government to, to finally put tariffs on all $500 billion worth of Chinese exports, the whole kit and caboodle. Now, we'll see if it goes that far. Um, I think Trump is hoping the Chinese will blink, that there'll be some kind of negotiation. But what we're asking them to do uh, would actually cause them to, to have to change the way they do things domestically, especially in terms of their state-owned enterprises. And uh, it's hard to see how they could quickly comply with that. Now, why, why this urgency? Well, I think the way this is being structured uh, can give us, give us an indication. All of these tariffs are justified not on the basis of the World Trade Organization or, or trade deficits. It's all based on national security. There are two domestic laws, the 1962 Trade Expansion Act, 1974 Trade Act, where Congress gives the president free hand, he doesn't have to go and ask the Congress, to uh, respond to dangers to the national well-being, such as import surges, overdependence on certain imports, et cetera, et cetera. So all this is being justified uh, by national security. Why are we thinking this is a national security? Well, Washington is taking seriously Xi Jinping's announcement that China will become number one in tech by 2025. Washington is starting to believe that and to see it as a threat. Let, let me give you a couple of statistics which illustrate uh, the concern. In the world today, there are 50 unicorns, tech unicorns. A unicorn is a tech company worth more than a billion dollars. Amazon, Google, um, Alibaba, Huawei in China. So of these 50 today, 26 are Chinese. 26 of the world's tech uniforms are Chinese. 16 are US. 26, 16, zero are European. And it's, the trend is to more Chinese dominance. And this is a statistic that I find very revealing. In terms of research and development, our companies putting money back into uh, developing new technology, strengthening their real uh, business. In the last two years, the top five American unicorns, the top five, spent $228 billion, 228, 
on stock buybacks and dividends. You know, our system is a highly financialized system, and even the tech companies basically look to the market, look to their stock price, look to their shareholders. If they buy back their own stock, that's what they use their profits for. In China, the top five unicorns spent only 10 billion on that kind of financial activity. The rest, 10 versus 228, the rest was plowed back into tech. Um, I think Washington is starting to think that this kind of a state-run uh, economy could in some ways begin to outperform us. Now, uh, the tariffs and the tariff threats have also extended to our closest allies. Here's Peña Nieto, the outgoing Mexican president, uh, Lopez Obrador, the incoming socialist president of Mexico. There was a scramble on the Mexican side to pin down a new NAFTA before Lopez Obrador came in because he's, he probably would pull out of the possibly pull out of the whole negotiation. So Mexico caved to our demands. Um, by the way, our demands, remember Trump saying, oh, these multilateral agreements, it's hard to get out of them. That was one of his main complaints. Well, one of our bottom line um, uh, points in the new NAFTA is that it should be renegotiated every five years, completely renegotiated every five years. How is a company to plan? And the Canadians and Mexicans said, that's crazy. You can't have an agreement on that basis because nobody would be able to plan. Um, and the other one was, there are arbitration panels now within NAFTA. We want to get rid of the arbitration panels. Once again, smaller countries like Mexico and Canada said, well, how will we know that we're going to get fair treatment if there are no arbitration panels? So the, the Mexicans caved. And after much kicking and screaming, the Canadians caved also. There's a lot of bitterness in Canada right now. I'm going up to give lectures up there in a, in a week or two, and I'm, way, I'm ready for the acrimony. They're really angry about how they really had no choice but to sign. Um, and they got a little bit of alleviation. It's not every five years to renegotiate. It's a little longer, but the basic principle they had to accept. But what everyone's waking up to is another provision in that new NAFTA, which went by unnoticed. Remember I said Xi Jinping spoke at the Davos conference a year ago, January. This January, President Trump went. And uh, it was all about fair trade, not free trade, but fair trade, America first, uh, bilateral, and a very interesting statement where he said, and I want to underscore that the United States will no longer accept state-run economies. The United States will no longer accept state-run economies. Now, what does that mean, for God's sake? I mean, you know, a lot of our closest allies have mixed economies with some state role, South Koreans, Japanese. Well, it's becoming more clear because Chapter 32, Article 10 of new NAFTA says that any of the three signatories can pull out of this agreement if either of the other two signatories signs a free trade agreement with a non-market economy. If, and the headlines in Canada are, did Canada just sign away its ability to steer its own trade policy? If Canada, Canada signs a bilateral trade agreement with China, will the US pull out of the new NAFTA? Well, the answer is yes. Um, this, is, this, is a, you know, this idea of kind of push China back out of the global economy, right? It's this kind of thing. And we've announced that now, now we're going to turn to Japan and the EU for bilateral deals. We're threatening 25% tariffs on their cars if we don't sign. And there will be a non-market clause in those agreements too. Can you imagine the Europeans agreeing to this? Or the Japanese? Uh, I mean, stay tuned. Uh, you know, and, and this may get fudged, but for the moment, um, uh, this is a, a potentially a major, major thing. Any questions about this part of the... Tom, you said uh, state economies. Uh, are you referring to like SOE state operated enterprises within countries? Yep. Oh, it's okay. State, so yeah, be, state run, state run. That could be state South enterprise. Korea, that could be yep. anybody like that. And China, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, it's interesting. 
uh, there was a big article in the New York Times about this magazine in February, um, looking back at, back at economic history. You know, uh, with all the adulation for Alexander Hamilton and the, the marvelous musical that's still out there at very high prices going around the country, and you know, great, great uh, cultural product, but Hamilton was the Trump of his era. Alexander Hamilton is the father of the tariff. Um, the United States had high tariff walls around it all through the 19th century. We had no income tax until 1913. We financed everything through tariffs. It was really only with 1945 that we became a free trading nation. And many other nations learned from this. In Germany, Frederick List, who was the main economist once Germany unified, studied Hamilton and studied the US tariffs. And Germany had tariff walls uh, in the late 19th century. Japan. Same thing. Um, countries, as they rise, tend to protect their economies. They tend to protect their domestic industries. We did it too. And then once they've risen, like Britain in the 19th century, like us, then free trade. It's all about free trade. And we're very critical of nations who try to protect their, uh, their domestic. So China has been very typical for a rising power. You know, they've used currency. They, they, they've subsidized their state-run uh, industries. They're trying to move away from state-run industries, but it's hard. I, I once visited the city of Luoyang, which is an old capital, an industrial town, and I, I got to know some Chinese there. And everyone's whole life in that town revolves around the state industry there. Their pensions, their education, their, their factory schools, their, um, their vacations, everything is done by, it's a real company town. So if you close that state enterprise, it's gonna, it would just rock the whole city. And so this is why we don't want, we, we, we consider that an unfair trade advantage to have that kind of an economy. Um, and we're saying, you know, let's, let's just not deal with economies like that. But it's very hard for them to change. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I always can, can come up with a question. And getting older, and, and you give a lot of presentation to digest, but I take it you mentioned that with Trump, um, He's going for this, we need this strong defense now, and it's kind of, I think of that Eisenhower warning about the military-industrial complex. But the advantage of that, it helps your economy. So I take it with Trump's administration, saying we have to become number one you know, in defense in the world. It's going to really help our economy. Now, the danger to that, as you notice, is our debt. Yes. And so, and of course, I think about great empires in the past, that's always been the downfall, England, whatever, yeah. is eventually- Imperial overstretch, they call right. it. Imperial the, overstretch, brings yeah. down. But I take it maybe with Trump's strategy then, is to avoid us become an empire that, that ends up losing, is he's gonna maybe someday hope for a bilateral agreement with China or with India, and, and I mean, I'm just speculating, but yeah. your thoughts about that? There's, yeah, absolutely, because, um, well, uh, I mean, we, are, we already have 800 bases around the world. You know, we already have a very, very heavy defense spending. It does create jobs, that's, that's definitely true. Um, we're worried that China especially, but also China and Russia, the way tech is rushing on rushing now in terms of satellites, cyber, um, AI, that they could offset our military advantage very quickly with high tech investment. And, and that that is something that we, you know, we got to keep up with. Uh, and that that's, that's the threat. Um, you know, in Art of the Deal, Trump says straight out, his negotiating style is to just create a high pressure atmosphere, raise the temperature on everybody, um, get everyone unsettled, um, and then once it's all softened up that way, then you go in and try to make a deal. Now, the new NAFTA is a good example. I mean, remember how, how he was treating Justin Trudeau at one point? Um, and, uh, you know, just, just threatening, threatening these high tariffs, and they caved. Uh, North Korea, little rocket man, you know, we're going to blow you off the face of the earth, blah, 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 and suddenly they're talking. Now, it looks as if there was kind of a misunderstanding about what the, each, each side meant. Uh, okay, but at least they're talking, right? So chances are he thinks that uh, by really raising the pressure on China, um, they will eventually come and try to strike some great bargain um, to, to offset some of this. But, but my point is that to do that, they would have to actually alter the structure of their domestic economy. And that would be too risky for them because that, that would cause cities like Luoyang to come into disarray. It would raise unemployment. It's not something they can do quickly. So uh, if it gets to that point, I think the US will have to be very accommodating on some of this. And it might, I mean, it, might, it could get to, I mean, 
th this could end up in some kind of a last minute arrangement of some kind. Right before the election, I think to get the stock market back up, uh, Trump announced that Xi Jinping had called him and was ready to talk. Well, the Chinese said, Xi Jinping didn't call Trump. What is he talking about? You know, uh, Trump called us, and um, you know, there's no agreement yet to meet, but at least we talked. So uh, you know, it's, a, it's an unorthodox negotiating style. And uh, I, I, I think the jury is still out, quite, quite clearly still out on where this goes. So any other? Um, well, you know, tr in traditional diplomacy, historically, if you're a great power, you try not to drive your two major adversaries into each other's arms. That's usually not a wise idea. So, you know, during the last phase of the Cold War, we, we drew China away from Russia. Uh, that was the whole opening of China. Well, right now we are pushing China and Russia very much into each other's arms. Uh, for the first time, uh, last in September, the Vostok East uh, military exercise featured major participation by the Chinese. It was a Russian exercise. Um, this was both countries played it up as the beginning of a new, very close strategic partnership uh, that would extend into military uh, cooperation. Um, this is a photo from Vladimir Putin's birthday, which he celebrated with Xi Jinping. And he said, he gave an interview later, Putin did, in which he said, I was so happy to be with my dear friend Xi Jinping on my birthday, and I want to spend all of my birthdays with Xi Jinping now. Well, this is obviously cosmetic. And they're trying to kind of signal to us, hey, if you keep putting sanctions on us right and left uh, and making us the, the new threat in your national security strategy, well, we, you know, we, we have ways of countering that. Now, the other uh, major shift in foreign policy, apart from this tariff approach to China and more bilateral approach generally, um, has to do with the Middle East, where there's been a real shift. President Obama. Uh, his administration concluded that it was in the U.S. national interest to get closer to Iran, uh, not just as a Middle Eastern power, but uh, as a part of this Eurasian chessboard. You know, Iran is a major part of Eurasia, and in terms of what China is doing, everything else it was felt that, and India, by the way, is really urging us to get close to Iran uh, because they see China and Pakistan on the other side. So the six-party agreement with Iran to uh, to, to stall their nuclear agreement for, uh, development for 20 years. Um, and it wasn't just it wasn't bilateral, it was a multilateral deal. Well, and regarding, you know, Obama had fairly tense relationships with Israel over the settlements. Uh, Netanyahu came to our Congress to argue against the Iran deal. Um, and when he was asked about our relationship with Saudi Arabia, Obama said, it's complicated. Well, President Trump's first overseas visit was to Saudi Arabia, not to Mexico, not to Canada, not to Western Europe. And in what really is a pivot, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel have emerged as probably our two closest allies right now in the world. And the Europeans are beginning to get the feeling that they are secondary to, uh, to those alliances. There's MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, people are now referring to him as Mohammed Bonesaw. Um, it's pretty clear that he ordered this horrific murder of, uh, of, a, of a Saudi journalist who was writing for the Washington Post in the consulate, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Um, the U.S. press welcomed MBS when he first came in. Tom Friedman wrote a, just an adulatory article about MBS. He's a, the new Arab Spring. Uh, and of course, this murder has really made people have second thoughts. But he's a very close ally. He's very close to Jared Kushner. And um, Trump likes MBS. Uh, of course, we decided to open our, move our embassy, rather, to Jerusalem. Um, this was a very unpopular move within the UN and among our European allies, who argued strongly against doing it. Uh, we've cut off aid to the Palestinians. Um, I think Jared Kushner uh, soon will present a Middle East peace plan, which will demand a lot of the Palestinians, including accepting their capital as being in a very tiny village outside of Jerusalem, the village of Abu Dis, as opposed to West Jerusalem. Um, as I say, this is a, a major tilt toward, uh, toward those two countries. So we've pulled out of the Iran deal. 
And on the 4th, which was what, Sunday, we reimposed massive sanctions on Iran, having pulled out. Um, the goal, Washington, pretty much stated goal, if you listen to Pompeo, is to cause the uh, Iranian government to implode. The word that's being used is implosion. There's unrest there. Their economy is not doing well. If we further strangle them, cut off their access to exporting oil, we could perhaps bring down the regime. A lot of calls to the Iranian population to, to take matters in their own hands. So, um, and we are demanding that other countries follow our sanctions. Uh, the Europeans are still on board for the deal. They think that the Iran deal is in their national interest. Uh, the Russians and Chinese, of course. So you've got cooperation among those countries to preserve the deal. Uh, our Israeli and Saudi allies are pursuing a strategy to try to get Russia to distance itself from Iran, especially in Syria. So Netanyahu meets with Putin all the time. They have a very close relationship. The aged and ailing king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman, who can barely stand up, traveled to Moscow to stand up. I'm sure it was temporarily next to, uh, to Vladimir Putin. And they've been urging us to do the same thing, to try to get close to Putin, to convince him. That's what the Helsinki summit was all about. It got lost. You know, the typical, just like yesterday, Trump makes a statement, then the questions start and everything goes to hell in a handbasket right, as he charges each red flag that's held up in front of him. And of course, that happened at this summit, and the real, in, the real importance of that summit was totally lost in the coverage. Um, in fact, the Russians did take certain steps. They, they, they placed their troops along the Golan Heights to keep the Iranian troops from getting close, which is what the Iranians, uh, Israelis wanted. But it's mixed. I mean, obviously, uh, Putin is not about to quickly abandon the Iranians. And of course, the Khashoggi murder has made all of this uh, more fraught. Um, and it's shining a light on MBS, and especially on the war in Yemen, which is a humanitarian catastrophe, which we are aiding and abetting with, uh, by providing arms to the Saudis, uh, targeting information, refueling. We have more troops and ships off the coast there than, than, than the public's aware of. And, um, and as I say, uh, since the assassination of Khashoggi, actually the Saudis have increased their attacks on Yemen. Um, and there's a real danger of worsening famine. So um, it's a mess. But what's the most interesting potential confrontation coming up, and this gets into our relations with Europe. Here's John Bolton a couple weeks ago speaking at an Iranian, uh, you know, the, the, sh the, the son of the Shah of Iran is waiting as a kind of a in exile Shaw. Uh, there's a government in exile that's taking, just like with Iraq. Um, and so Bolton announced the new sanctions and he said he warned of terrible consequences for any country that dares to do business with Iran after November 4th. And he especially said, we do not intend to allow our sanctions to be ev evaded by Europe. He singled out the Europeans and warned them. Now, for their part, the Europeans, and here's um, Federica Mogherini, the Italian foreign minister of the EU. In the last months, the EU has passed a law, a law forbidding EU companies from complying with, the US, with US sanctions. By law, European companies are not supposed to comply with our sanctions. And they've set up a special purpose vehicle of, of, of funds to help bail out companies that get hit by US secondary sanctions, because we're threatening to impose heavy secondary sanctions on any country uh, and business that does, it, it works with Iran. We want to strangle the Iranian regime, period. So it's, a, it's, it's gonna be a slow motion train wreck. Uh, we've allowed a couple of exemptions for oil, but temporary ones to companies in China and India, not in Europe. Um, uh, a number of European companies have pulled out in advance of all this, not wanting to get caught in the train wreck. But I'm not sure where this is going to go. And, and as I say, the Europeans are getting the distinct feeling that they are secondary to U.S. interests uh, in the Middle East and that we're willing to risk a real crisis in relations for, for that. And this comes then to this aberration or culmination idea in his State of the Union address to the EU uh, in, in September, uh, EU Commissioner Jean-Claude Juncker 
the whole speech was about distancing the EU from the United States, using the dollar less, uh, getting it a, more of a defense and an independent foreign policy. The whole 10 points of the speech all had to do with that. And meanwhile, the Chinese and Russians are talking about pooling their uh, currencies for all their future trade, not using the dollar. Um, uh, Juncker said, uh, the European Union imports 92% of its imported oil in dollars. Why? He said, why should we be using dollars to import our oil? Let's move away from that. Now, it's one thing to say that, another thing to, to actually restructure that way. Um, but our use of sanctions, and maybe you could say overuse of sanctions, when you add it all up, are causing countries now to wonder about long-term adjustments. Um, to the extent that countries move away from the dollar, we will face growing inflation here at home. That will be the immediate effect that we'll feel uh, if this happens. And one of the main things the Chinese could do if the trade war really gets bad is they could not only stop buying our bonds, but even start pulling out of our bonds. Because of the deficit we're running up, we're going to be issuing a lot of new government bonds over the next six months to a year, a lot. What if there's not as much demand? Then the interest rates go up to attract that demand. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, th this is all very embryonic. And, uh, but and here's John Bolton announcing just a week or two ago to Putin that we are pulling out of one of the last major nuclear agreements with the Russians, the INF Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement. Um, and the main um, victims of this move will be the Europeans because it's there, it's in Europe that these missiles will be deployed. Uh, and they'll be the ones facing the threat. So once again, the Europeans are watching this and saying, you know, where is this going to go? Um, now, President Trump is saying he's pulling out of this agreement because he wants to make it include the Chinese. Because China does have intermediate range forces that could hit our aircraft carriers. And we have no defense against them right now, the, the East Wind missiles. So you know, there's a logic, maybe pulling back Trump will offer something to bring the Chinese and Russians together to talk about this. Maybe. As I say, a lot of this is, it's, it's hard to see where it's going to go. Now, I, um, any questions on that before I conclude? I promise I'm concluding here in a minute. Uh, any questions on this part of, uh, yeah. Yeah, and there's some, uh, to the extent there have been violations, it's been going on for a while. Uh, the Obama administration chose to look the other way. The basic, basic thing that happened was this. Um, when Putin came in, you know, there was a kind of a, a bromance, if you will. Uh, after 9-11, he was the first to call, uh, offering support. Um, in 2004, he allowed the Baltic states to join NATO. And um, signaling, however, no further, not Georgia, not Ukraine. But at that point, George W. Bush pulled out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the missile defense treaty. Now, for the Russians, this was a key part of the overall arms control, the idea that we would not develop a missile defense that might deprive them of a, of a, of a, of a second strike capacity. And we declared we were going to put these installations in Poland. Um, it was after that happened that the Russians began to um, do a few things, which, yes, I think technically could be seen as violations. They say it was in response to pulling out of the, of the anti, uh, uh, missile defense treaty. Um, doesn't justify what they did. So, um, yeah, there have been violations, not massive, but, but violations. Obama chose to look the other way. And uh, we're now choosing to use those as a, a reason to get out of this. Um, it could lead to a massive escalation on both sides and more deployments, especially in Europe, of medium range weapons. Yes. Um, Trump is showing a lot of support for Israel and Saudi Arabia. And at the same time, my understanding is that the Wahhabi are the extreme uh, Islamists behind the Saudi throne. How can that possibly be? Because they're very much anti-Israeli, I assume, and yeah. pro-Palestinian. Right. Yeah. Um, 
yes, we're getting close to those two, and but it's still Saudi Arabia. I mean, the the Wahhab movement, Wahhabism, uh, is a big part of the power base of the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia. It has been since the 1700s. This goes way back. Um, and yes, the Wahhabs are radical Muslims, and therefore uh, probably are not really happy with a close relationship to Israel. You know, it, under the surface, Saudi Arabia and Israel are very close right now. I think there's defense cooperation going on. I think if there's an attack on Iran, eventually they will cooperate on it. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so that's the logic that's driving them uh, together. You know, our whole relationship with Saudi Arabia is based on two devil's bargains. The first one, uh, the House of Saudi merged in that part of the Arabian Peninsula on the basis of, a, of a, an agreement with the, the Wahhabs. Uh, that they would support the House of Saud, and the House of Saud would support their activities. And their activities more and more have to do with establishing madrasas overseas, exporting their brand of very conservative Islam. The second bargain was, was at the end of World War II when FDR met with Ibn Saud, the founder of modern Saudi Arabia, on a, on a ship, I think at, outside the Yalta Conference, and they agreed. You know, at that time, we had no access to Middle East oil. The British had control of Persian oil, BP, is really uh, Anglo-Iranian oil originally. It was that relationship that led to the coup in 1953 against an elected Iranian uh, Persian uh, president, Mossadegh. Um, and it was with the Sauds that we then got into the game in the Middle East. So the basic bargain was privileged relationship for oil. You can do whatever you want domestically, including in your relationship with the Wahhabs. So that double bargain has been going on. And it even survived 9-11 when most of the hijackers were Saudi. Um, so, and um, what MBS is doing right now, a lot of people think that Mohammed bin Salman with his very stormy, impetuous personality is gonna lead to destabilization in Saudi Arabia because he's angered a lot of the royal family. You know, he's arrested his own relatives. He, his, his, his cousin, former crown prince is under house arrest. His own mother is under house arrest. Um, and, uh, and, uh, the, the, and, and I think that some of the conservative Islamists don't like uh, the way he's allowing women to drive or movie theaters, that kind of thing. So I know in Washington there's a feeling that this is a bit of an a a, a unstable situation developing in Saudi Arabia, potentially. So yeah, the Wahhab factor is still there very strongly, very strongly. Any further? Well, I'm going to conclude now. We've got a little time left, and we can go a little beyond 8.30. Um, one of the most interesting situations developing now, uh, and it involves China, but not only, is the question of governance and the new technologies, which are coming on so fast and so strong. What kind of governance is going to emerge from this technological era we're entering into of, of, of cyber, of artificial intelligence, of virtual reality, all these things? Now we've, we have thought that it's going to be democracy. You know, Tahir Square, the uprising in, uh, in Egypt, and the way that people were able to cloud source and get people to a demonstration, I think everyone felt that that was an indication of where this was all going to go. But, um, and this is, the jury's out on all this. I'm only just mentioning this not to say this is what's going to happen, but just to give an idea of the kind of um, reverberations that are going on right now. The... Um, uh, the uh, Freedom House, which is the main um, kind of monitor of, of democracy around the world, um, in its report uh, in 2018, said that 2017 was the, uh, uh, was the most uh, difficult year for democracy uh, in decades as people around the world began to turn against the basic tenets of democracy. Now, you know, we see in Eastern Europe, uh, Brazil, now uh, we see, yes, the emergence, as we said earlier in the conversation, of, of populist movements. And so the question is, how far, how far can this go? Um, in the European Union, there's gonna be a, a kind of a watershed in May. Uh, this is the European Parliament in Strasbourg. There'll be European parliamentary elections. And the conservative uh, anti-immigrant parties of Europe are joining forces to, uh, to make a big splash in that election. The 
the deputy prime minister of Italy. Italy has a very right-wing populist anti-immigration government. One of the main countries of Europe is in the hands of this movement. Salvini said recently, the European elections next year will be a referendum between the Europe of elites, of banks, of finance, of immigration, and precarious work versus the Europe of people and labor. Our project consists of creating an international league of populists. Now, the Trump administration is de facto encouraging this. Um, the main advisor right now to what's happening in Europe is the fellow on the left. Steve Bannon is spending all of his time in Europe now, traveling around from Hungary to, uh, to Britain to meet with UKIP, to France to meet with Marine Le Pen, uh, working very closely with there's, that's Salvini in the middle, the, uh, uh, the deputy prime minister of Italy. So we'll see what kind of a, what happens. Uh, I know a lot of European governments are worried because in the European Parliament elections, people vote their gut. You know, it's, it's, since it's not really a national election, these tend to be unpredictable um, elections. So there is a, there's an issue with democracy. Um, if you go to Barnes and Noble these days, there's just like mushrooms, the number of books about democracy. Uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, paperback version of, of what happened has a postscript on the crisis of democracy. So this has really become a kind of a uh, cottage industry, if you will. And I've looked at, I have to admit, I, I sometimes sit at Barnes & Noble and look at books at, while I'm having coffee. But anyway, um, uh, really a common theme among these books is, is the inequality theme, that, that, that a lot of this dislocation is arising from growing inequality. A, um, a uh, very famous analyst uh, in, at, at Lee Kuan Yew University in Singapore, um, Kishore Mahbubani has a recent article about the rise of populism, and he said it differs depending on the region and the country. He said in Europe, the main cause of this new populism is immigration, because these countries are not used to immigration. They tend to be nation states in the real terms. But he said in America, the cause is plutocracy. That's the reason for, for these movements coming up now. And um, yes, people blame immigrants, but the structural problems are more economic. Whether he's right, I don't know. Anyway, as the West deals with this situation, over in China, they are announcing a new form of governance. It's, a, it's part of Xi Jinping's thought, which is in the Constitution now. Um, the idea that new technologies will allow the perfection of central planning in a way that never was possible before. So what's happening in China today? They're putting up facial recognition cameras literally all over the country. Um, millions and millions and millions, including in the farthest, most remote villages of Western China. Um, in, a, in, a, in villages out there now, to get toilet paper, you need to go through facial recognition. There are photos online, and there have been reports about this. A lot of theft of rolls of toilet paper. Well, now you, the peasant has to go before a facial recognition. He gets a roll, and not again for 10 days. It's all programmed. Um, crossing a street, a major intersection in, China, in Shanghai or, or Beijing these days, these are wide streets. If you jaywalk, by the time you're halfway across the street, your photo appears on a massive screen at the intersection along with all your personal data, which is embarrassing enough, but it means that the government has registered the fact that you jaywalk and they know who you are. Most Chinese police in the major cities now, and increasingly in the countryside, wear sunglasses. Uh, a New York Times journalist a few months ago uh, convinced a police officer to lend him their glasses, and he put them on and looked, and looked at a person across the street, and that person's photo appeared on the inside of the lens, along with their information. Now, the Chinese have announced that with this computer, the exascale computer, I think it's a computer array, that can do a quintillion computations per second, that's a billion billion, they can pinpoint any citizen within 1.3 seconds. Um, and they are collecting all the data necessary to establish something called the social credit system, which is, they say, will be operational by 2020. So facial recognition, all of your online activity is monitored. Um, other aspects of your sort of uh, social behavior 
will all be filtered into, and they're taking blood samples of the whole population, they've done that long since, into, a, into this computer, and you'll get a score. And based on that score, and you'll get a report every six months or every year, you will, there will be uh, rewards and punishments that will follow. If your score is low enough, you might lose your passport, you might uh, not be able to uh, qualify for certain kinds of housing. Uh, this is still in development, but uh, they're announcing that this will be in the interest of all. And you know, the, the techies in China, the Jack Ma's, are 100% behind this. You know, Jack Ma has said that we will perfect planning this way to the good of everyone. Uh, it'll be like giving a CAT scan or an X-ray to society once this is fully operational. Now this, of course, is, I think for Westerners, it's a bit hard to, to take. But you know, a, a very high value in Chinese culture is harmony. And there's a long tradition in China, not just Confucianism, but legalism was the, uh, the basic creed at the time the Chinese government or state was formed, the Qin Dynasty. And it sounds a lot like what they're doing now. People are not naturally good. Um, they'll respond only to rewards and punishments. Social order can be achieved through a strong leader enforcing strict laws. And the new thing now is and using the modern technologies that are out there. I, you know, I've run this by some Chinese students, uh, most of whom are basically OK with this. They say that if it makes it a more law-abiding society, uh, you know, they, they, they'll often say we don't really Kind of, we don't really trust each other, especially since the Cultural Revolution, which destroyed a lot of social capital in China. And this is maybe better. And I even had one student say, well, look, this data is being collected in your country, too. The technology is there. So you can't put it back in the box. Somebody's collecting this. And your corporations, by law, have to give it up to the government anyway, under the Homeland Security provisions. And they said, would you rather have this new technology in the hands of semi-autistic libertarian techies? Or, or use it for the good of the society. You know, now, of course, as I say, we would have a very different view of this. Uh, but I think the governance challenge based on these technologies will be one of the key issues going forward. And I, the sooner we get our own democracy back in order, in my view, the better. Because other, other models are emerging. So I'll stop there. And um, any questions on this last part before we, or anything else, really? Just, just to follow up on your last comment there, what will it take to get our democracy back in order? What will it take to get our democracy back in order? <laughs> well, um, you know what? I sometimes think just pushing the reset button would be a good start. Just go back to some of the structures and policy we had during the Nixon years. When we had a more regulated economy, this is before Glass-Steagall was kicked out, before the Futures Modernization Act. We had a progressive tax rate during that time. We had more labor union. Uh, this was before the 401k. You know, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr once said that the, the great, from his point of view, I think you'd say achievement um, of President Eisenhower was to make the New Deal bipartisan. You could have had a Reagan-type conservative come in in 1952 and undo a lot of what the, had been done under the, under the New Deal. That didn't happen. You had a succession of Republican presidents basically accepting the, that reality, but really up through Nixon. Um, I mean, a lot, there are a lot, of, a lot of speculation of how it went the other way. But I would say, I think future historians will see Bill Clinton, and to some extent Obama, as having made Reaganism, Thatcherism bipartisan. Because a lot of the really fateful deregulation of our economy took place under Bill Clinton, for better or worse. Um, so as I say, I think looking backwards, I mean, you know, it's hard to get people convinced, you know, to change things looking forward. But there's a lot of nostalgia on the right for the 50s and for backwards. And I, I almost think, hey, let's just go back. But that's just my, that's just me. Um, any other? Yes, Bob. Yeah, um, you know, I believe in the reset. <laughs> and uh, 
Um, it seems like uh, we're setting up a confrontation between uh, e our economic and military power trying to counter China's sort of state-run power. Um, and